get this show on the road, everyone. Let me turn this off. Put this over here. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's start off with some push ups. That is a good idea. We need to start off with some push ups. You're right. We should do that. Ah, oh, you're welcome. What is up, Sejo? What is up, Mr. Shaw1414? How are you all doing? I'm doing well. Today is an amazing Sunday evening where his mercies are new every day, even though we don't deserve it. All right. Today at church, I picked up a little pamphlet book reading, which is something I want to read for us. Uh, I think it's something that can help us out. I got this little pamphlet book. You might have seen them at various churches, other areas, but it says, I feel ashamed. And then it's a little book with some scripture about it. I think we should just knock out the whole thing tonight and talk about shame. So that's kind of what I want to do tonight is talk about shame, have a chill, kind of easy um, stream. Did I hear about what, what Nike did with their shoes? Yes, I heard. I heard about their shoes. Of course I did. I heard about it. Not surprised. Nothing really surprises me anymore these days. Everything is pretty wicked and evil, so I'm not surprised anymore. Is this a legit Bible read stream? Yes, it is, the bug bug. <laughs> Weren't you here the other day? This is a legit read the Bible stream. That's what I do. Except tonight I'm reading from a little pamphlet book called I Feel Ashamed. So we're going to be reading about shame tonight because that is something that everyone deals with is shame. And it is a very heavy burden to carry around shame. So I thought we would talk about that tonight. Uh, all right. Let me pray us in, I guess. Now, some people just make fun usually. No, I'm not making fun of it. <laughs> Bonjour. What's up, Ethan? No, I'm not making fun of the gospel or, or the Bible or anything, but I'm going to pray us in. Dear God, thank you so much for this Sunday where we can be reminded to to love you and live by you, Lord. Help us in our sanctification. Help us care. Help us to fight temptation and get past sin in your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That's messed up? Yeah, it's pretty messed up. Let's put blood in people's shoes. It's gross. But yeah, just so everyone knows, I have a little pamphlet book that I'll be reading from tonight. I know you all were expecting Romans 4, but we will continue with Romans 4 tomorrow through our study in Romans. But tonight I felt like talking about shame because this is something that a lot of Christians have, a lot of people have dealt with. So let's kind of talk biblically about shame. So there's a little introduction where we get this person and they're going to be used as an example throughout the rest of the book. Shannon's uncle sexually abused her throughout her childhood. He told her that she was a seductress and that she would be punished if she told anyone. Ashamed, Shannon was silent for years. As she grew older, her uncle's cruel ridicule and humiliation crushed her spirit. Shannon's parents were unaware of the abuse. At one point, Shannon tried to tell her mother, who expressed shock and disbelief. She reprimanded Sharon for telling lies that could destroy her uncle's reputation. Nothing was done to protect her, so the abuse continued. Though Shannon had received the Lord Jesus Christ as her savior when she was a young child, her mother's reaction took Shannon's faith in God and caused her to doubt her family's love. During her teen years, her anger grew into a bitterness and rebellion that were met with condemnation and a sharp criticism from her family. I know it's a pretty heavy start, but there's it's always a happy ending with Christianity. 
Shannon withered and hardened under their disapproval. She married young to escape her home and her uncle, not realizing that her new husband was as troubled as she was. They divorced after a few months, intensifying her family's disapproval. Shannon sought emotional relief by plunging into self-destructive partying and immorality, but nothing satisfied the ache in her soul. Some years later, Shannon was experienced panic attacks, failed relationships, angry outbursts, and depression that sometimes required hospitalization. Eventually, she remembered her abandoned faith in Christ and decided that it was time for a change, time to return to the Lord. Oh my gosh, guys, I'm having trouble breathing because I can't breathe out of my nose because of my allergies. Welcome to Dryden Takes Pills Hour. Taking my allergy pill. Wait, before we start, read Leviticus 18.22. Uh, why? <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember that verse. What does that have to do with anything? All right, we're, let's keep reading. Mr. Shaw, what does that have to do with anything? She joined a doctrinally sound Christ-centered church and there sought counseling to overcome her anger, depression, and fear. The gospel became fresh again and she started to understand that the love and the presence of God had protected her soul. She received his forgiveness and learned to trust God more and more. Her uncle had died, but Shannon forgave her mother and asked for her parents to forgive her. Gradually, her relationship with them began to mend. Today, Shannon's new church continues to provide her and with help through Bible-based teaching, biblical love, godly fellowship, prayer and support, and practical living skills. She holds a job with a Christian business owner that has returned to and has returned to college. She's now ready to move on with her life. Shannon knows that she is on the right track now. She experiences periods of peace and enjoyment. Her new friendships are healthy and growing, but she still feels ashamed of her past. Her friends do not know about the abuse or her rebellion, and Shannon fears discovery. What would they think? How could they want to befriend an awful person like me? Doubts cloud her mind. She fear Her fears lead her to analyze every conversation. She mentally flogs people for their insensitivity. Holy smokes. Luke in Novak 28, thanks for the follow. How are you doing? So glad you're here. Welcome to Story Hour. Surely people are angry with her. Are they secretly whispering behind her back? Will they turn her away like everyone else? Or worse, will they turn on her? She cringes and bristles at the thought. At times, her inner battle becomes very intense. When dark thoughts and doubts persist, her confusion and burden grow heavier, and she wants to withdraw from any kind of relationship. Tidal waves of self-doubt and fear drive her to safe Hello. harbors. Hey, Steel Panda, thanks for the follow. How are you doing? She knows her friends are puzzled when she retreats, but she wants to avoid causing any more catastrophes in her life. She condemns herself for struggling with such stupid feelings, and she feels ashamed of feeling ashamed. Memories of her family's accusations and her past sins mercilessly haunt her. It's all true. I cannot deny what a failure I have been. She concludes that people are right to reject her, but her spirit recoils at the thought of their abandonment. Shannon pleads with God for relief, but she knows it's impossible to undo her shameful past. And in spite of her best efforts, she is sure she disappoints the very people she wants to love. Again and again, she fails. How can she ever truly be free? I don't have an OnlyFans, just an OnlyPans. I just pose with pictures of frying pans. So that was Shannon. Here's Gwen. Gwen grew up in a stable, loving family. She went to church regularly and attended good schools. Today, Gwen is a manager manager, with a reputable company, and she has a responsible husband and three healthy children. Life hasn't been easy, to be sure, but Gwen is generally happy and functioning well. Except for one thing, she feels like a failure. A person who doesn't have to suffer abuse or rebellion to feel ashamed. 
A person doesn't have to suffer abuse or rebellion to feel ashamed. Like Shannon, Gwen has been sinned against, though in different ways, and she consistently falls short when she compares herself with her friends and co-workers. In spite of perpetual dieting, she is overweight. So she is always ashamed and self-conscious about her appearance. At work, Gwen's feel incompetent when others tease her for making mistakes or jeer her when she follows company policies. She thinks, if I were the parent I should be, my children wouldn't need so much correction. Gwen lives with a nebulous sense of spiritual shame, too. She knows she's a sinner saved by Christ's grace, but she feels the weight of her own inadequacies more than she does the love of her Savior. She asks for God's forgiveness almost constantly, but she doesn't feel forgiven. Gwen tries to make up for her inac inadequacies through her many acts of service at home and in the community, but she doesn't feel included. Gwen generally feels like a fake. Though she tries, she can't shake an underlying sense of personal failure, disapproval, and shame. Where do people like Shannon and Gwen turn? How can they overcome their sense of shame? You may be surprised to hear that Jesus Christ holds the answers to that problem of shame. So we will consult scripture to see what Gwen and Shannon have missed. But before we examine God's solutions, we have to look at two kinds of shame and more common responses to each. All right, this is chapter one. It's a little bit bleak. Chapter one's a bit bleak. But let's continue reading with chapter one. Shame-filled living. Shame is a... Same as a painful, guilty feeling due to the consciousness of having done or experienced something disgraceful. The feeling of being caught doing something bad or of being seen while sinning. Dr. Edward Welch describes shame consciousness as being exposed, vulnerable, and in desperate need of covering or protection under the gaze of the holy God and other people. Shame may follow sinful actions or it may arise from accepting blame or failure. Whether guilt is real or imagined, shame holds a person hostage with a condemning declaration, you are bad. Shannon and Gwen both live under that sentence, perhaps you do too. No one likes feeling ashamed, but efforts to relieve shame often lead to frustration and increased distress. Overleaf are some common reactions to persistent shame. So here's some common reactions to persistent shame. Was it finished typing? Okay. <laughs> Have you ever been questioning God's goodness and sovereignty, doubting God's existence, love, and acceptance, rejecting God, social discomfort leading to withdrawal, varying degrees of self-pity, mental and physical self-deprecation, self-sabotage or self-injury, addictive behaviors, that's a big one for a lot of people, especially for me, wallowing in despair and self-doubt, Indulging vengeful thoughts, actions, anger, and bitterness. General general irritability. That one's definitely for me. I get irritated in traffic a lot. Anxiety and worry. Perfectionism and or le uh, legalism. Escape or pursuit or of relief through such means as daydreaming, overeating, overworking in career or ministry. Intense pleasure seeking. Excessive socialization or social withdrawal. Shopping, leaving home. Adultery, divorce, or suicide. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I shop so much. Oh my goodness, guys. Um, <laughs> uh, next topic. No, just kidding. Perhaps you recognize some of these patterns in yourself or a loved one. Some of them may seem mild, but the results can be devastating to your soul and to your relationships, even with people who are far removed from the source of your shame. Shame generally takes two forms. I am bad because what I've done... In this case, personal sin produces guilt, and out of guilt comes feelings that we will call sin shame. I am bad because of what other people have done. The sins of other people hurt you in ways that cause feelings that we will call provoked shame. So there's two senses of shame that we'll be talking about. One is sin shame. I did something bad, and now I am ashamed. Or provoked shame. Someone did something bad to me, and now I'm shamed. Edward Welch describes these two sources of shame. Sin and shame is something we bring on ourselves. Provoked shame is done to us. Everyone has the experience of sin shame, but not everyone has this shame intensified by provoked shame. What's up, Factual? We always condemn and shame ourselves and others, yet God doesn't condemn us. We feel the conviction of God after we sin, but continue to condemn ourselves, even though God has forgiven and forgot our sin. 
What's up, Jeff the Fish? How are you doing? Yeah, Ethan, I think you're totally spot on because as we read in Romans is that there's now therefore no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So God doesn't even condemn us anymore. He didn't condemn the the adultering woman. He doesn't condemn us, but it's amazing how we continue to condemn ourselves. I should be a pastor? Uh, maybe someday, but not now. I don't feel conviction a lot, I K Y. Well, you have to pray and read your Bible more. Mortal Beast, I'll try my best to stay the longest I can. I'm having a hard time with emotions. Uh, Mortal Beast, I would, I really hope you stay because this might help you. Um, this might help you a lot. Sin shame. Sin shame is the consequence of your actual guilt. When you offend God, the shame that results is true and right. If you have been mercilessly victimized, it may be hard news to hear. But it is important, so please read through this entire section. Liberating good news will follow. So we have to start with the bad first, and then we'll get to the good. Every person on earth, without exception, has committed what God calls sin. Sin is any thought or action that opposes or contradicts God. One sin is all it takes to be a sinner. James 2.10 says, For whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. If you have ever lied, entertained a lustful thought, or used God's name flippantly, you are guilty because of what you have done. God clearly says that there are no exceptions. All have sinned. That's Romans 3.23. Gwen is guilty of harboring grudges, complaining, overeating, disciplining her children in anger, and hating the body God created for her. When Shannon curses her uncle, refuses to forgive her mother, doubts God, cherishes bitterness, or mistreats her body, she sins. Both are responsible for their responses. Sinful responses may seem understandable or even reasonable, and you may think that you can make up for them later, but sin is serious. Because Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Good deeds, penance, and self-reformation are insufficient to undo the acts or the effects or the penalty of sin. Scripture says, We are all like an unclean thing, and all our and all our righteousness, our best efforts, are like filthy rags. That's Isaiah 64, 6. As hard as it is to hear this, sin shame tends to tell you the truth. I am bad because of what I have done. Your guilt is real and irreversible. It needs to be addressed, but you are helpless to address it because you can't undo it. Therefore, you need God to forgive your sins, exchange your guilt for His righteousness, putting you into a right standing with God based on the merits of Christ, that's 2 Corinthians 5.21, and provide new life and identity that powerful fight shame, that powerfully fight shame. That's Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 6. Sin shame is actually merciful because it was designed to drive you to God for His free pardon in Jesus Christ. When you respond by repenting, sin shame is no longer necessary, so God removes it. We will discuss this further in the next chapter, but first we will consider the second source of shame, which is provoked shame. From a young age, Shannon experienced provoked shame. I am bad because what of others have done. Shannon's uncle and mother sinned in ways that hurt Shannon and fostered her sense of self-condemnation and disgrace. Even today, she feels betrayed, exposed, embarrassed, and confused, ashamed. As with sin shame, provoked shame condemns Shannon as a bad person. But unlike sin shame, provoked shame is a lie. No matter how she may feel, the sins of other people do not condemn Shannon in God's sight. That's Ezekiel 18.20. Provoked shame condemns no one before God. But if believed, its lies can do terrible damage. Gwen's co-workers ridicule ridicule her. Her husband is highly critical. She falls short of society's definition of beauty. Her close friend betrays her confidence. Gwen accepts provoked shame's lies and condemns herself based upon those words and actions of others. So Gwen feels helpless, embarrassed, disrespected, and frustrated, ashamed. What's up, Mimi27? How are you doing? 227? It's good to see you here. Provoked shame seems hopeless because the sufferer cannot prevent or fix the sin of others. As with sin shame, someone outside the situation must intervene. Jesus Christ is that someone. Baba Bowie. Ooh, uh, turn it up. What is up, dude? How you doing? Thanks for the follow. 
Jesus Christ is that someone. But before we look at Christ's solutions for shame, we, we need to unpack the problem a bit more. Can we get a praise break? What do you mean? I just started. <laughs> How about at the end of the chapter? I don't know what you need, mean by a praise break, but maybe at the end of the chapter. We're about a fourth way through the book. So this is going to be a, a solid stream tonight, everyone. We have seen that sin shame tells the truth. I am bad because of what I have done. Sin shame warns you of the condemnation of sin. When you heed the warning, sin shame drives you to God. Therefore, sin shame should be believed. But provoked shame lies to you. I am bad because of what others have done and cruelly condemns you for something you can't control. Provoked shame should be rejected. Yeah, we're reading the whole book. It's, it's not too long. So, the power of shame is broken when truth is believed and lies are rejected, as we shall see in the next few chapters. However, the common tendency is to reject the truth of sin shame and accept the lies of provoked shame. Generally, you can react to sin shame in one of two ways, by believing you are guilty and accepting God's invitation to be forgiven in Christ, or by rejecting the truth of sin shame and trying to deal with guilt on your own by excusing or denying sin, blame shifting, or loathing yourself. Sometimes I feel like I fall into the category of loathing myself. Excusing or denying sin sounds like this. What I did wasn't so bad. It wasn't really sin. I was just reacting normally. God understands how hard life is and won't hold this against me. But scripture says every sin violates the purity and holiness of God. Therefore, every sin offends him. Even one bite from forbidden fruit is enough to condemn you. Christ had to die for even your smallest sins. They are that serious. There is none righteous, no, not one. Blame shifting says, in effect, my sin is understandable and acceptable because I was provoked. Someone else made me sin, so it's not my fault. But that attitude is not approved in scripture. You are responsible for your responses to any situation. No one can make you sin. It is your choice. Christ is your example. Though he was brutally provoked, he did not sin. He provides all you need for godliness so that you have no excuse. Self-loathing goes in the other extreme. Instead of turning to God, the shame-driven person says, I am so bad that I hate myself and must be punished. I must pay for my sins. Even Christ can't help me. But God asks you to come to him for forgiveness, not to punish yourself. Amy Baker writes, when we sin against God, there should be some loathing. But that should lead us to repent, not wallow. We are all bad. That's why we need a savior. It is pride to believe I'm so bad, I don't deserve to be forgiven, when God has promised to forgive the worst of sinners. Yeah, that's uh, the blame casting is definitely what homosexuals talk about. There are many ways to interpret and exercise provoked shame. All of them involve accepting responsibility for what others do rather than rejecting condemnation. Here's a few examples. More will follow in chapter 4. That open your mind? Yeah, it's, this has been good for me. That's why I thought it'd be good for all of you as well. People criticize, hurt, and reject me. Therefore, I must be bad. The truth. God does not and will not hold you responsible for the sins of others. Their criticisms, harmful actions, and rejection reflect on them, not on you. I fail to measure up, win approval, achieve, so I am bad. The truth. Human limitations do not condemn you in God's sight. He remembers that we are dust. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I suffer, therefore I am at fault. God does not fault you for feeling pain or for suffering at the hands of oppressors. The sinless Christ himself suffered. He acknowledges the hardships you face because he faced them too. And he wants you to respond as he did. Definitely got the pamphlet book in church. Yeah, I got this today at church. I said that earlier. I got it today. I thought it'd be helpful. Isaiah is a prophet. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it'd be helpful. That's why I got it. 
It is not easy to discern between truth and lies, especially when you are suffering. Shannon is innocent of her uncle's sin, but her pain is real. His unspeakable actions have caused her to suffer, and he is accountable to God for what he has done. Though she is not responsible for his cruelties, she fails to see Baba that her bitterness. I track your IP address? Dude, sick. How are you doing? What's my favorite juice? Probably like orange and pineapple juice. I think that's pretty good. She fails to see that her bitterness, fear, and rebellion are her contributions to the problem. Therefore, she does not address her sin shame before God. Instead, she loathes herself and doubts God because of what her uncle did to her. Sometimes we are our own worst critic. We would forgive others but won't forgive ourselves. Yeah, it's uh, that's something that I've definitely dealt with. Uh, it's part of my testimony is I would forgive everyone except myself. And I really hated myself. What do I think of apologetics? I, I think apologetics, apologetics are cool. Pedro Games 3677. Thanks for following. What's up, Pedro? How you doing? Someone ship me that book. <laughs> I'll send it to you after if you want me to. Um, you can DM me your address and I'll mail it to you. I'm not even joking. I'll send it to you. Um, let's see. I think apologetics are cool. I'm not the best at them. That's not really where my gifts lie. Gwen is ashamed of her appearance. Her, si her sin shame signals that she is responsible for the sins of ingratitude and gluttony, but she does not hear it. Instead, she fills her life with food and good works to try to silence her pain. She reads her Bible and goes to church, dons a happy face in public, and douses her soul with pleasant distractions. But she has withered inside because she has rejected her sin shame. In addition, Gwen believes her husband's false accusations and eternalizes her co-worker's jeering. She accepts the lie that she is at fault for their cruelties and feels victimized by shame. Have you recognized the ways in which you contribute to your shame by accepting lies and rejecting truth? This is a difficult question because it requires you to examine what you believe about God, yourself, and the people who have harmed you. Perhaps you don't want to unleash painful memories again. You may think that questioning a loved one constitutes disrespect or even unbelief. Or maybe you're afraid of further rejection. But I encourage you, dear reader, to move ahead now in a positive pursuit of truth about your shame. The truth Christ has promised will set you free. Next is chapter 2. Yes, please. Definitely going to need to read on my own. That hit home in my spirit. Yeah, just DM me your address on Discord and I'll send it to you after we're done. Chapter 2. Overcoming Shame. So far, we have identified two sources of shame and condemnation. Your sin sin shame and the sins of others provoked shame now we turn to the good news jesus christ removes sins condemnation which is romans 8 1 and despises shame biblical counselor Tim timothy lane writes we experience shame because of our rear sorry we experience shame because of our real guilt underneath our anxiety bitterness and defensiveness is guilt that is why we live with the feeling that we are not quite making the grade. We can't rid of our shame until we address the problem of our real guilt. Jesus Christ alone counteracts guilt through grace alone, by faith alone. Let's look more closely at the good news. You said about your testimony, when you need content, you should have a testimony page. I feel a lot of people have interesting ones. Testimony night? Yeah, that would be cool. I'm going to go. All right, Mr. Shaw, thanks for thanks for hanging out, Mr. Shaw. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God opened the door to freedom when Jesus Christ took the sentence of death upon himself. He can offer forgiveness for sin because he lived a perfect life, fulfilling the requirements of God's law that we have broken, and willingly offered that life as an atoning sacrifice on the cross. Our sin shame is silenced by his righteousness, which is given to us when we put our faith in him. The gift of eternal life is free through Christ Jesus our Lord, but is not yours until you receive it. No one automatically becomes a child of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. That's John 1, verse 12. If you confess with your mouth 
the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. That's Romans 10 verses 9 through 11. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. The forgiveness of Jesus Christ covers those who receive him by faith, no matter what sin has been committed or what atrocities have been experienced in this fallen world. You can only receive forgiveness by humbly admitting your sin and confessing your need for Christ's sacrifice. Approaching Christ with such an attitude is the necessary first step. He removes your sin shame in forgiveness when you believe. Did you notice the promise in Romans 10 verse 11? about whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Here is God's magnificent promise that in Christ, the full payment for your sin has been made forever. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No one who receives Christ by faith will ever be rejected by God. Take a moment to examine yourself. Was there ever a time when you humbled yourself before God, confessed your sin, and trusted him alone to forgive you? No penance, no self-improvement projects, just belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus as payment for your sin. When you humbly come to Christ for salvation, God makes unconditional promises to remove condemnation and adopt you into his family forever, thereby assuring you of a secure relationship with him and a home in heaven after death. Those blessings will never be removed. You may recall that Gwen and Shannon both received Christ as children. After years of rebellion, Shannon turned back to Christ. Gwen never overtly turned away, yet the two women continue to wrestle with shame. With shame. Why? One reason why feelings of shame continue is that sin continues. Until you reach heaven, you will struggle with this fallen world, the devil, and your own sinful habits. Through condemnation, though condemnation is gone, you still have to fight against sin. The good news is that in Christ you have the power to overcome sin and grow in his likeness. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. That's Romans 6.14. God continues to use your sin shame to drive you to Christ, where you are to humble yourself and admit where you need to change. This is the essence of Christian growth, and victory is assured when you submit in obedience to the process. But pride resists humility. In an article about Peter's refusal to allow Jesus to wash his feet, Winston Smith describes the battle. At least part of us would find prideful satisfaction in being able to take care of our own mess, but another sizable part would like to avoid having another, especially Jesus see our filth. And the thought of Jesus having to touch it, well, that makes us just want to say no. Jesus' message is as direct and startling as Peter's. Unless I wash you, you have no part of me, John 13, 8. Well, that clinches it, doesn't it? Jesus insists on putting us, on putting an end to both our pride, our pride and our shame. We must acknowledge how faulted we have become. We trod through a fallen world. We tramp through the mess of our own sin, and we've been smeared by the sinful deeds of others. We are rebellious. We are wounded. We are proud. We are ashamed. We need all of it washed away. Whether it's shame or pride, part of me doesn't want Jesus to cleanse it. But there's no other way. God uses sin shame to signal that your old sinful habits of thought and behavior need to be replaced with new scripture-driven ones. But you can focus on your faults and sins so much that you deny the completeness and forgiveness and righteousness in Christ. Shameful thoughts feed on emotion, reason, and experience, not scripture. When you dwell in shame, your feelings declare, it doesn't matter what the Bible says, I believe my shame. In that mindset, you may neglect or misuse scripture to focus on condemnation rather than look worshipfully at Christ. Self-deprecation, negativism, anger, fear, and anxiety live where scripture's true meaning has no toehold. Responding Biblically Though truth is unchanging, God allows you to choose what you will believe and live for. These choices are based upon what you want most. Therefore, it is important to evaluate what you desire. You probably desire good things. Like Shannon and Gwen, you want people to love you. Being loved is good. When you feel loved, you thrive. 
but when rejected you may feel like re retaliating wallowing or isolating yourself your reactions to rejection reveal your true desires god wants you to respond with love for him first and then for your neighbor christ demonstrated love when his enemies rejected him is that your usual response if not your desires need to change shannon is not satisfied with being accepted in christ she wants certain people to accept her too people of her choice she is willing to rebel wallow and complain if she doesn't get what she wants shannon sin sin shame warns her that she should evaluate her motives when she is willing to sin her desire for acceptance is more important to her than following christ's example when she is willing to sin her desire for acceptance is more important to her than following christ's example where shins where sin shame that's such a she sells seashells by the seashore where sin shame reveals your sinful desires thoughts and actions you are responsible for making changes you should take that responsibility seriously shame is self-condemning but first john 1 9 declares if we confess our sins god is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness Confession means wholeheartedly agreeing with God about your sin as you turn to obey Christ. God's cleansing is complete and does not depend on your feelings or the depths of your sin. You should confess your sins no matter how you feel. 1 John 1 9 uh, does not require a complete listing of every sin that you've committed. No one's memory is that good. But you should confess the specific sins that God has brought to your mind. Scripture promises that God forgives and cleanses all your sins when you confess, choosing to believe God's word on that even when you don't feel forgiven. Trust Scripture, not your feelings, to tell you the truth. Humbly agree with God that your sin is ugly and despicable and plan to change your thoughts and actions to line up with Scripture. Stop beating yourself up. Instead, accept forgiveness in Christ. Tell yourself the truth. And you, being dead in your trespasses, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Remind yourself that you stand righteous before God by faith in Christ. Your position in him is not maintained by good works, but by Christ's payment for your sins. Therefore, you can never lose it. After you confess your sins, anchor yourself in the fact that Christ has completely forgiven and cleansed you. How's everyone doing? I need some water. Sin shame, sin shame, sin shame. Good. Awesome. I really hope this is helpful. Follow the example of Christ, who leads and transforms believers. It's an everyday battle indeed. Maybe forgive ourselves truly something. I know. It's tough. Follow the example of Christ, who leads and transforms believers. To follow Christ means wholeheartedly seeking to know and please God in thought, motivation, and behavior. You may think you cannot please God because of your faults and failures. But because you are forgiven in Christ, God is pleased with your sincere effort to follow Scripture. Reject doubts about His goodness, forgiveness, or love. That is the way, day by day, to grow into His likeness. Shame cannot dwell in that environment. Edward Welch writes, Call out to the Lord. Don't cry in your bed. Face your doubts about God's plans for your life. Right now it feels like misery. But if God sent Jesus to die so we could live... Why would he be uncaring now? God's plans include hardship and disappointment, but his love has already been proven in Jesus, and it is more sophisticated than we know. Even in our hardship, he is doing good. Sometimes the good is teaching us to trust him. It is a spiritual response with eternal value. Sin shame is appropriately addressed by receiving Christ's forgiveness and following his example as scripture requires. Next, we will look at how Christ and our new identity to him diffuse provoked shame. Here's chapter 3. Professor Jordan B. Peterson. <laughs> What's up, Jordan B. Peterson? How you doing? 
This is making you tear up? I, I don't... I... Okay. We'll, we'll pray at the end as well. Chapter 3 is embracing your new identity in Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.2 calls you to renounce shame, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, condemning ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of Lord. To renounce means to refuse, to follow, obey, or recognize any further. So we're going to renounce provoked shame with humility as Christ did. Christ's example provides hope because he refused to follow or even acknowledge provoked shame, even while he was mocked, beaten, and hung naked to die on a cross. He endured the cross, despising the shame, by defying the shame and directing his thoughts against it. Do I know William Lane Craig? Uh, I don't believe so. I'm not sure. Also, how did you get the name Professor Jordan B. Peterson? That's sick. <laughs> I love that guy. That guy's sick. I, I hope he becomes saved soon. Um, I know he's close, but Jordan B. Peterson, really cool guy. This response may not seem like humility to you, but it was. Rather than allowing shame to infiltrate his thoughts and his accusers mocked him, and rather than submitting to anger and fear as he was abused, he humbly accepted that God had given him to do. Though he was the eternal son of God, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. That's Philippians 2 verse 8. Christ was despised and rejected by men, yet in return he chose not to despise people, but rather to despise the shame they tried to inflict on him. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Hello there. Uh, Rezzy, thanks for the follow. I think he'll, he will eventually become a Christian. I think so, too. I think he already has been... Uh, I think he's already been saved. I mean, I saw that one video where he was crying and understanding the, the cross. I think he's already been saved. Because we know repentance comes after salvation. So I think he'll be there. Um, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. That's Hebrews 12, verse 1 through 3. Who's William Lane Craig? I don't know. <laughs> Hello, Professor. How easily our Savior could have raged or fallen into despair at the abandonment, abandonment abuse, humiliation, and the injustice he experienced. He would have been completely justified, but rather than dwelling on the wrongs done to him, Christ rejected shame by remembering his identity, embracing the purposes of his father, focusing on his part in God's plan, and looking forward to the joy ahead of him. He's a top Christian theologian. He destroys atheists. So why do I say he'll become a Christian? He puts the fear of God into atheists. I'll have to look him up. He sounds amazing. I have a couple videos I need to watch still. Um, it's funny, funny enough, I have a Jordan B. Peterson. I have a Jordan Peterson video I'm going to watch. Hello uh, Callum FC, thanks for the follow. How are you doing? Uh, let's see, William. William Lane Craig. Yeah, I'll have to look up this guy. Naturally. Yeah, I'll watch him. Baba Bowie. Hey, Lincoln 9009, thanks for the five. Thanks for the follow. Pour milk on my head, I will sub. I don't have milk. And I wouldn't do that. We're in the middle of a serious reading. We're going on a walk together. Come along. Awesome. <laughs> I feel bad. <laughs> for people destroying atheists. I don't know. Yeah, let's keep reading. Um, let's see, where was I reading from? New life in Christ brings new identity to you, too. As a child of God, you are defined as eternally beloved, chosen, holy, adopted, forgiven, and redeemed in Christ. 
No one can take that away. You are accepted in the beloved one, Christ Jesus, no matter what anyone else says. Rather than looking at yourself in yourself in your sense of unworthiness and filthiness, rather than trying to hide from God, believe the words of Christ. You are not beyond God's grace. Humble and deliberate acceptance of your true identity in God's family to claw shame for you, just as it did for Christ. Uh, you just put me in the pocket and listen. Awesome. God had an eternal purpose for Christ's suffering to provide the way of redemption for mankind. So too, the trials in your life hold eternal value in God's hand. He has given you something to do. Lay aside your starving dreams and embrace his plan for you. In him, also we have obtained an inher inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That's Ephesians 1 verse 11. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. We do not look at the things which are seen, but are at the things which are not seen. For the things that which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7 through 9 and verse 18. Christ's role was to die to take away the sins of the world. A difficult position to be sure, but an essential one. Where would you be right now if Christ had not fulfilled his role by dying in your place and rising from the dead? Imagine if he listened to the provoked shame instead. He would have resented you instead of loving you. He would have believed himself to be a failure because the people rejected him, wallowed in his physical helplessness and pain, Hello? and lost his perspective. Um, one in this tank... <laughs> Thanks for the follow. Instead of providing redemption, he would have brought vengeance upon those whom have been called to save. Eternal life would have been lost for you. The human race would be completely perish in sin. But Christ loved his father and he loved you. Therefore, he despised shame and willingly died, knowing that he was accomplishing God's will. You are required to do the same. Jesus said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. That's Luke 9, verse 23 through 24. Shut up, computer. Put effort into denying your demand for human acceptance and freedom from pain. Instead, choose to follow God's highest commandments to love God and other people wholeheartedly as Christ did. He actively chose to die to save sinners. Through him, death is overcome, and you are now called to live and share the gospel and make disciples for his sake, not to be defined and overcome by shame. When you live for Christ, your focus is drawn away from the hardships of this world and a sense of purpose is born. Choose to believe that God has equipped you for good work he created you to do. In a sound biblical church, learn how you could get busy serving him. Christ looked ahead to the joy before him. He had an eternal perspective. Christ did his work to rescue souls as he looked forward to the returning to heaven. Choose that kind of focus. Partake joyfully in the bringing of other souls to Jesus. Be confident that your trials are temporary and have a valuable purpose. And look forward, as did Christ, to your glorious home in heaven. We must remind and encourage each other every day. Yeah. Choose humility as a means to despise shame. Provoked shame could not condemn Christ because he chose to humble himself before his father. In doing so, he despised the shame. You can overcome shame in the same way. But how? Aren't humility and shame the same thing? When you tell yourself how flawed you are, or when you mentally replay your failures, aren't you being humble? In a word, no. Shame and humility are vastly different. Stuart Scott defines humility as the mindset of Christ, a servant's mindset, a focus on God and others, a pursuit of the recognition and exaltation of God, and a desire to glorify and please God in all things and by all things he has given. 
whereas humility is based upon God's grace, shame denies grace and perpetuates misery. The chart opposite illustrates how exercising humility simultaneously despises shame because you because the two are mutually exclusive. You cannot be humble and full of shame at the same time. To choose one is to exclude the other. So here's, here's some examples of the difference between humility and shame concerning the perception of God. Humility believes God's character is good. Shame believes God is distant and uncaring or harsh and punitive or on meaning in life. Humility believes and focuses biblically and submits to God's purposes, pursues meaningful direction, but shames meaning in life, focuses on and submits to self-condemnation and feels meaningless. Humble fear fears God and stands in awe of him. Shameful fear fears man's actions and opinions, fears the future. So there's uh, interesting stuff there. Choose Christ's humble attitude. Christ-like humility submits single-heartedly to God's agenda because of the wise, just, and loving nature of God. Christ disregarded his own reputation in favor of his role in the salvation of mankind because he knew God's plan was best. His service included unspeakable suffering, humiliation, and pain, but believing in the good purposes of his Father, Christ glorified God in his suffering. Shannon and Gwen's hearts focus on another agenda. Though they hate how they feel, they follow their provoked shame. How about you? Are other people's actions and opinions more powerful over you than God? Humble yourself. Deny lies and destructive reactions and follow Christ instead. We have to choose Christ's humble thinking. Let this mind be in you who was also in Christ Jesus, who being from the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. That's Philippians 2, 5 through 7. Following Christ's agenda means denying your natural tendencies and replacing unbiblical thoughts with the mind of Christ. Shannon's provoked shame is perpetuated by her negative thoughts about herself, her failures, her family's offenses, and her hopelessness. Instead, she should choose to humbly focus on God, by whose grace we are made free. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. That's James 4.10. Be confident in this very thing, that He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 1.6. Gwen tells herself, because people treat me poorly, I'll never amount to anything. I'm a failure. But she can turn her mind to the scripture that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 You are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Colossians 2.10 Both women have built their lives upon a false foundation. Perhaps your beliefs, like theirs, also contradict scripture. To follow Christ, humble yourself by admitting that you have a that you have accepted lies. Scripture says, We have renounced the hidden things of shame. That's 2 Corinthians 4 2. Let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That's Hebrews 12 1. The beauty of Christ's humility is seen in the demonstration of his love towards the very people who treated him poorly. He forgave them. Consider this patience towards the disciples who misunderstood him, failed to support him, and ran away in his hour of need. He did not treat them as if their sin deserved. He treated them according to his Father's love for his creatures, and he's done the same for you, and he calls you to follow his example. He served them. His life on earth was a picture of selfless service and grace towards his enemies. He actively sought their well-being rather than getting back at them. He spoke truth in love to them. Christ acted justly, but he never complained or sought vengeance when he was treated unjustly. His statements on the cross were all directed at ministry to others and submission to the Father. He left the results to God, and he asked you to do the same. He considered others before himself. His name is above every name, and he is the one to whom every knee shall bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. But he willingly laid all that glory aside for your sake. Next is chapter 4. Renouncing all shame in Christ. (laughs) 
I see the chat is popping off tonight. Sorry, I haven't really been reading it, but I've been reading the book. Um, keep talking amongst yourselves. <laughs> Chapter 4, Renouncing All Shame in Christ. Following Christ includes honoring him in your responses to the events and people in your life, even when they are evil and harmful. While Christ never excused his oppressors, he also did not demand to be honored, loved, revered, or considered. Instead, he stood for truth and lived for his Father's purposes. His humility is our model for overcoming shame, even when bad memories and some consequences may still remain. Let's look more closely at how that is accomplished. Gwen's Temptation Gwen humbles, Gwen humbles herself before God and commits her life to him afresh. But later that day, her husband falsely accuses her of failing to discipline their children. Provoke shame arises, and she feels hurt. Out of habit, she thinks, I'll never be a good mom. My kids don't stand a chance with such a bad mother. Gwen renounces shame. Humble attitude. Feelings of shame interrupt Gwen's thoughts. She, regard, she regards the alert and prays for wisdom. She realizes that Christ wants her to be humbled herself and stop their negative thinking. Notice that she does not deny that her husband is sin, nor does she accept the responsibility for his role in the wrongdoing, but she chooses an attitude of grace rather than resentment. Biblical thinking. Gwen considers how she could improve her parenting skills and communicates to her husband in a way that honors Christ. She thinks about how to overcome evil with good. Biblical action. Gwen follows through wisely by seeking her husband's advice. She treats him respectfully, even when he continues to be critical and harsh, because that is what Christ did when people were critical and harsh with him. In other words, she reacts according to Christ's example rather than her husband's. In addition, she asks a godly woman how she can be more biblical parent. More of a biblical parent. Shannon's temptation. Shannon has a lot of bad memories to overcome, especially when her uncle's sins come to mind. Alright guys, here comes the intrusive thoughts in the bad history, so please listen up. Shannon renounces shame. Humble attitude. Shannon's resentment against her uncle causes sin shame, which reminds her that she too is a sinner. She decides to overcome anger and shame with biblical forgiveness. Biblical thinking. Shannon chooses to dwell on the fact that her, sin, that her sin sent Christ to the cross, yet he responded graciously by offering her forgiveness and a new life. Shannon does not excuse her uncle's sin, but she puts away her anger by being kind, tenderhearted, forgiving, even as God in Christ forgave her. Biblical Action in following through on forgiving her father as Christ has forgiven her, Shannon takes action by promising not to hold his sin against him anymore. Instead, she remembers that God promises to bring justice. Because she has carried resentment for many years, she must renew her promise of forgiveness often because it comes up frequently in her mind. Thus, she honors God. Whenever shame creeps in, she reminds herself that God is pleased with her growth, even though she still has a long way to go. Gwen's temptation. Because she's overweight, Gwen despises her appearance. We must trust God and surround ourselves with good people who accept and love us as whole too. Like even one is enough. Do not surround yourself with shoo -boo 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 people as much as possible. Yeah. Because she is overweight, Gwen despises her appearance. Humble attitude. Gwen admits that she has been insulting the one who created her body. And has been rejecting and has fearing rejection rather than loving God and other people. Thus, sin shame is a part of the problem. When she catches herself making comparisons, Gwen confesses her sinful thinking and accepts the full forgiveness of God. Biblical thinking. Rather than wallowing in displeasure, Gwen decides to compare her shame laden thoughts with Scripture. She sees that she fuels her own shame when she unfavorably compares herself with her peers. Scripture says that others, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Biblical Action Gwen realizes she has accepted the world standard of beauty. Instead, she gives thanks for how God has fashioned her body and her life. In addition, she seeks to become a better steward of her body by eating and exercising wisely, then choosing to be content with how she looks. Thus, she repents of sin shame, despises provoked shame, and brings glory to God. 
Gwen and Shannon learn to treat their feelings of shame as a signal to biblically examine their thoughts, motives, and actions. The charts at the end of this chapter demonstrate more ways to renounce shame by thinking and acting biblically. I provided just a few examples here. Spend time in God's word to learn more about overcoming shame God's way. The passages in the chart will help you get started on your way to life, on your way of life. Change takes much diligent effort, consistency, and patient endurance, but keep at it. Hello get involved. Uh, Zayjam, thanks for the follow. Sejo says, don't be afraid to communicate with your concerns with God. It's only natural for us to question the things he does for us, so it's important to get with him with all of our problems. Yeah, and that's the other thing is in verse uh, Hebrews 4, 16, I believe it says that we can boldly go to the throne in time of need for mercy and grace. Boldly go to the throne. Growth into Christ-likeness is a lifelong process. Through Christ's forgiveness and example of humility, shame can be progressively overcome. You can refuse to dwell in the dark secret world of shame any longer if you choose to confess sin, shame, and more, and renounce provoked shame whenever you recognize them. Every time you respond biblically, you please and honor God. So here's a few more examples. Um... Uh, so stuff examples like suffering isn't fair bad things happen to everyone because we live in a fallen world I'm also bad because I've sinned against God uh, but God doesn't make us wallow we choose what we dwell on in Christ I have hope and a new identity so I must not call myself names or doubt his purpose for my life I will think and act as Christ did when bad things happen to him this is the first time you've seen a bible study on twitch well we're out here <laughs> Welcome, I'm so glad you're here. All right, here's the conclusion to the chapter. Here's the conclusion. Shame does not have to define you. In Christ, you can have forgiveness, a new identity, a new way to live in righteousness and humility. Respond to sin shame by receiving Christ's forgiveness for your sin and then learning to live as he did. Renounce provoked shame by choosing biblical humility and turning your thoughts and actions to follow scripture. If you consistently turn to truth and reject lies, looking to Christ and following his example as scripture teaches, his grace will overshadow and diffuse your shame. Regular attendance at a sound biblical church will help you grow in scriptural knowledge and faithful service. If you need additional help, a good biblical counselor can assist you further in your journey. Uh, so here's some personal application projects. One, respond biblically. Refuse to let your feelings tell you what to do. No matter how strong you, how strongly you feel, inform your feelings with scripture. Here are some steps you can take. Every day, for two to three weeks, keep a journal. When you feel ashamed, try to identify circumstances or people triggered those feelings. When you start to feel ashamed, what was happening? Who was involved? If you were alone, what thoughts were going through your mind? Record any reasons you felt ashamed. To the best of your ability, identify if you are dealing with sin, with sin shame or provoked shame or a combination, which again means shame that you brought upon yourself by doing bad or shame that someone else has done to you. My schedule is down in the description, but I do five days a week at, uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Write how you responded to shame. What did you think? What did you do? Write down how you will act differently according to the truth. At the end of each day, log how you followed through with those actions. Pray from such verses such as Colossians 1, 9-12, Philippians 2, 5, and 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Write the verses down and keep them at hand. More help for sin shame. The answer to sin shame is to confess your sins and choose to believe that Christ has fully forgiven you. Name the specific sins that you need to confess. Read 1 John 1, 8 through John, 1 John 2, 2. Confessing sin means agreeing with God and turning away from that sin. In these verses, what does God say he will do if you confess your sins? How complete is his forgiveness? Write down some of the ways your wrong actions have caused trouble for you. Write your plan to stop your sin and do right instead. Write down your plan to fulfill any responsibilities you have been neglecting. Ask someone to help you be accountable for following through with your plan. 
Read 1 John 2 verses 1 through 2 again, as an advocate comes into your defense. According to this passage, does Christ seek to punish or shame you? What is he doing instead? That's a verse we can read right now. Pull out your Bibles. For 1 John 2, 1 through 2. Which says, My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Yeah, I feel bad for my East Coast guys. Because I start at 7 p.m. Eastern, which is 4 p.m. for you guys, which is kind of in the middle of the day. But I just, I have to start at 7 p.m. Eastern because I wake up every day at 4.30 for work. So I just have to go to bed soon. Read Proverbs 29, verse 25. Okay, let's read it right now. Why not? Proverbs 25. Verse, oh, 29, verse 25. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. If someone criticizes you, how will you treat that person the next time you see him or her? You do poorly on a test. What will you say to your classmate who does well? Your boss frowns at you. How will you respond to his frown? You see disapproving looks as you rush into church late. Will you choose to think about this during the service? How will you show love to your pastor, to those who disapprove of you? You see someone from your, bat, from your past and a bad memory is triggered. How will you greet that person? So that's just a little bit of self-help. Um, and that is the end of the book. Thank you guys so much for listening to me read this book. And Mordo, I, I will send it to you if you want. Just let me know your address and I'll mail it to you. Yeah, Jane's over here at 7 a.m. <laughs> it's 12 a.m. for Ethan. Well, she gets up early for work, I think. Yeah. But how's everyone doing? That's uh, about shame. How we're not supposed to carry shame because Christ doesn't even... We've been completely forgiven of all of our sins all of our past present and future sins yeah it was a really good book and if you guys liked that book i'll probably be doing more of this because i i have a few more i can show you i have similar books on suffering thankfulness priorities and discontentment which that one might be a good one discontentment and these are all still Baba Booey. <laughs> Baba Booey. and those are all still pretty short books so we can read those on various other days uh, but those of you who are new here, I stream five nights a week, 7 p.m. Eastern. I stream every day except Saturday and Wednesdays, which I might change to every day except Wednesdays and Fridays. Because Fridays have been kind of difficult with just my work schedule, but it's always a work in progress. We'll figure it out. Uh, the other thing that we're doing right now is we're currently doing a study in Romans so we're reading Romans one or two chapters at a time during our streams so that has been that's been fun as well can you link the book in chat I might get it yeah uh, let me see if I can find it on Amazon or something um, it's a very small pamphlet Let me see if I can find it. So it is on 
it is on Amazon. So right here. Um, I'll also, oh my goodness, whoa. <gasps> I got my 12th month subscriber badge. Check that out, guys. That's awesome. I've never actually seen it in person. I'm the first one to get it. I got my new badge. Baba boy. Hey, Jacob August 1. Thanks for the follow. I also put it in the Discord. So if anyone wants to join the Discord, uh, feel free to join the Discord. You can click that link to join the Discord. But I put the book there in case anyone wants to purchase it. Um, I think the biggest takeaway is we have all the answers in the Bible and it's really uh, we have all the answers in the Bible but sometimes it's difficult to find the specific verses that we need all at once which is why it is very important that we have to preach to ourselves daily every day we have to remember the truths of the gospel and those truths are that we have been redeemed, we're a new creation, we're a new creation, we've been forgiven, every one of our sins ever, even the future ones have been forgiven, and they've been completely forgiven, and it's very important that we remember that. We have to remember also that our salvation is not dependent on ourselves, but it is dependent on a perfect God who loves us, so we have to remember that. But yeah, thank you everyone who's new here. Thank you for joining. Um, I think that's probably going to be the end of the stream because we usually do about an hour. Uh, if I don't have a job like I do now where I work 70 hours a week, we would go for a lot longer. But right now, that's kind of that's kind of how it's feeling. But I'm glad you guys like Baba that book. Uh, Femme from Mars, how you doing? I'm glad you're here. Um... Should we keep going? What, should, what are you guys feeling? What are you guys feeling right now? I, I know we didn't really have a discussion tonight because we kind of just read an entire short book, but I don't know. Um, I just finished my taxes, and that's cool. Go with the flow. I got to pay my gas bill, my house gas bill. I don't want to do that, but I got to do that. <laughs> Let's do the fifth. I'll just pay it now. Pay. Just paid my gas bill. I'm down with anything. Awesome. Um, tomorrow, we stream tomorrow as well. Tomorrow is Monday, and then Tuesday we stream as well. So please come back 7 p.m. Eastern time, which is New York time, for those of you who don't know. Tomorrow we will be reading... Romans 4. I know it's random, but can you guys pray for my brother? He seems to be value, valuing the gospel less and less and having a worldly mindset. I think he's a progressive Christian, but I'm not entirely sure. Taxes are awful. Yeah, but I'm getting like 500 bucks that I'm immediately going to put towards my, my debt. <laughs> um, yeah, Avocado, we'll be praying for your brother. Um, we'll, we'll pray for him. Don't worry. We tend to be a prayerful bunch, but we will definitely pray for him. Um, but yeah, guys, other than that, I think I'm going to end the stream here. Thank you guys so much for, for joining us five nights a week. I really appreciate it. Uh, this, this time together is always helpful and healful for me. Could I add people to your prayer book for me? Yeah. Uh, send me the list on Discord, and I'll add them to the list which uh, has not been updated in a while because I've been just so busy. Um, I need my pen. If you guys could also pray for me, I, I work a lot. And if it wasn't for this Bible study five nights a week, I would probably just be so exhausted physically but also spiritually um yeah so please pray for me pray for my sanctification um if that would that would be really helpful if you guys were praying for me as well uh but there's only two weeks left of this very exhausting job and then 
I'll go on to the next job wherever the Lord leads me, which I'm excited to find out what that is. So that'll be fun. But yeah, please pray for me as well. And please send the list to the Discord. Um, Ethan, that would be awesome. But yeah, I'm going to pray us out. And then I'll always, as always, I'll see you in the the Discord where I'm, I don't know, feel like the only active one. <laughs> yeah, it's a Red Sox hat. It's a baseball hat. Um, dear God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for the free gift of salvation that's dependent on you and not us. Please help us fight our shame biblically with the biblical truths that you don't even see it anymore. That when you look at us, somehow all you see is Jesus. Lord, please help us to seek sanctification, not as a gruesome, heavy burden of duty, but instead because you find joy and you are proud of us for following you biblically, Lord. Thank you so much for your love for us. And please help us to be humbled and focus on you and other people instead of wallowing in shame, which is somehow still a form of pride because we just think about ourselves. God, like John the Baptist said, less of us and more of you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, guys, join the Discord, and I will see you all later. Thank you so much for watching. Bye, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Good night. Goodbye. Happy Cowboys. Boom, 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 boom. Happy Cowboy. Boom. Um, I understand that even though you're leading the Bible study, you're just like us and need just as much prayer. Yes, absolutely. Just because I know how to read doesn't mean I'm any, any more special than you guys. Um, thank you for praying, and I will see you all later. Goodbye. Good night.